So this video is going to go through some considerations when returning patients to sport after an ACL surgery. So start to think about the factors that are involved in the decision making. So these are some of the topics that we're going to cover today um, in this video. The main criteria for return to sport is really a number of tests and things that we take the patient through. However, there are risk factors for injury and it's really important that we're aware of those when we're taking patients through these tests. So the things that we'll talk about are lower limb strength testing, what that looks like and what we expect a patient to get to. It's also advised that patients go through a combination of different hop jump tests. In addition to that, sport specific testing, and that will vary from sport to sport and really what equipment or staff is available there to the patient. And then we'll talk a little bit about psychological readiness in terms of does a patient mentally feel like they're, they're going to get to the, to the level or did, are they psychologically ready to return to sport? So looking at a few risk factors for re-injury. Firstly, it's important to remember that having the surgery itself or just having an ACL injury is a risk factor in itself. And especially when we're comparing to to healthy controls. So someone that hasn't had an ACL injury or surgery. So having the surgery isn't kind of free reigns to, yeah, you're not going to do it again. It's more, well, actually, you've had the surgery. You're more likely to, to do it again within the next few years compared to someone that hasn't. So landing mechanics is also looked at, in, especially in females, in terms of a, a risk factor for re-injury and the injury itself in the first place. So looking at this diagram, it's called dynamic valgus, where essentially we're just looking at that inward collapse of the thigh beyond the midline of the body. So that's something that's trained and drummed into patients a lot when they're rehabbing to essentially negate that process. Looking at re-injuries as well, you are more likely to do the other side. So the side that hasn't been operated on. Uh, I think two thirds of re-injuries are on the other side and yeah, one third is the actual operated limb itself. So reduced quadricep strength and returning too early are one of the other or the other couple of risk factors that are noted as um, highly correlated with re-injury. So if patients aren't hitting close to around mid 80s in terms of percentage of quadricep strength between operated and non-operated limb, those tend to be more likely to re-injure and additionally returning too early. So you can see from this diagram here that those that wait more towards the 12 month mark to return to level one sports and what is meant by level one sports in this respect is hard cutting and jumping, they're less likely to re-injure it um, quite significantly. So you're looking at the midpoint around like 10% area here. Um, and then those that return a bit earlier, you're probably looking at re-injury rates probably in the mid thirties in terms of percentages. So based with the information that reduced quadricep strength results in high risk of uh, re-injury, it's really important that lower limb strength testing um, is done with these patients. So what we're looking for as a gold standard is 90 percent limb, limb symmetry. So essentially, can the patient on the operated side do 90 percent of what they can do on the non-operated side? This can be measured in a variety of ways. So in terms of time, repetitions and lots of different tests, really. Um, for example, we can do endurance tests like single leg squat endurance when does the patient can't do any more single leg or double leg wall squat endurance test I mean if you're going to do double leg you're not comparing left and right but if you do single leg in time then you, then you start doing that knee extensor endurance tests and strength tests so endurance tests meaning how many repetitions can they do with a certain weight when comparing left and right maybe some strength tests looking at lower repetition maxes such as maybe anywhere between yeah one to six really but with a certain patient population 
that don't have access to high expensive or high quality expensive equipment, such as, as you can see, this isokinetic machine, which um, is really used in professional sports. Not a lot of people have access to this. So we are probably looking at our leg press endurance, leg press strength tests, as well as our knee extensor and single leg squat and all those types of tests really for patients that don't have access to that high quality equipment. So in addition to strength testing, we're looking at a combination of hop and jump tests as well. So jump and hop height can be measured with equipment such as fourth place or applications on phones. But what we're really looking for is patients that can confidently do their maximal effort, essentially, and that the scores over time are getting better. Most people don't don't hit the performance heights of what they did before the ACL. They can get pretty close. But as a, for me myself, I would look for more, make sure a patient can do maximal effort with full confidence, essentially. And, and obviously, yeah, scores are improving over time. There are things like the landing error scoring system, which is useful for assessing lander mechanics and looking at the different components of, of landing. Various hop tests for different parameters. And what, sent, what in, in essence that means is that, for example, if you look on, on the slide here, you've got a slide hop test, which will calculate the number of hops a patient can do, making sure they're clearing that 40 centimetre gap over a 30 second time limit. That is more of an endurance test. Whereas if we're testing a single leg hop for distance, it's not so much endurance, it's more how much power or distance can they generate and can they confident land after maximal hops or one maximal hop essentially. Whereas this is more not maximal hops, but endurance in terms of the side hop tests. So we've got to make sure that we're testing a variety of different parameters when we're using these tests. Same criteria as the strength testing, ideally 90% limb symmetry, but as we know, very hard exercises and patients don't typically get to 90%. I mean, your top athletes might do, but what we're looking for is how much progression is this patient making over various amounts of months? So sports specific testing is very difficult um, because you, to truly replicate the sporting environment, you've just got to put a patient in there. But I mean, we got to break down the barriers to get there. So obviously things like non-contact, lower intensity initially will be helpful. So it will vary sport to sport as well and positions within sport. So for example, if you've got a midfielder in a, in a, well, in a football team or soccer team, compared to a goalkeeper, they're gonna be doing a lot more different amount of twists and turns. And you're probably with goalkeepers, you're gonna look more at landing and so catching a ball and landing effectively on one leg. Whereas outfield players, yes, that's gonna be an element of it, but there's gonna be a lot more twisting and turning and cutting and pivoting. As I said, goalkeeper might be standing there for 10 to 15 minutes at a time, and then they go into action. So it's important to remember positions um, in respect to that. And when we talk about sport specific change of direction, landing, acceleration, deceleration, those are all big components. And we should be looking at them with all athletes really, but acceleration and deceleration will look a lot different in someone that's playing tennis and to someone that's maybe playing a team sport when they're doing a lot more acceleration deceleration in that sport. The way I try and look at it is um, building up to required training loads. So a bit like I've touched on with the goalkeepers and footballers, how much ground is this person covering? How many maximal sprints does this patient want to build up to? You're not going to hit them in the first few months, but what are we looking to build into? And unfortunately, it might look a bit different to a professional player, to someone that just plays a couple of times a week. So we really have to take the amount of times per week the patient's going to be doing it and the level that they're doing it. So psychological readiness is an important factor and it's one that's often overlooked. 
but essentially return to play questionnaires can predict readiness to return to sport. So typically those who psychologically are struggling a little bit tend to take that bit longer. It can be useful to use as a baseline measure and retest at the later date. So the way I tend to approach it is maybe testing at six, eight, 10 months. You can do a little bit sooner. You can even uh, branch out to six and nine and 12 months. But essentially what we're looking at is that, is that patient improving in terms of their psychological readiness over time. The questions are aimed at confidence and performance and emotions. So essentially, do you think that you're going to re-injure your knee playing your sport? Are you nervous about playing your sport? Are you confident that you can play your sport without concern for your knee? So lots of different questions like that that, that might bring out some talking points or areas that we need to consider that might not necessarily come up because a lot of ACL rehab is really strength and physical performance focused. But we do have to be a little bit mindful of those who overestimate. So if someone is really psychologically ready at month six, let's look into that and see if they understand the importance of the return to play measures or because they feel no pain and they've got full movement. and They think they're ready to go. So sometimes we've got to hold those people back a little bit. So really hope you found that video useful. Thank you very much for watching.